All right, God, we come before you this morning acknowledging your presence in this place, acknowledging that you are holding all things together, that you could not be more present, and yet we still pray, Father, for an outpouring of your spirit in this place, in us, to transform us to being the image of Christ. Grow us up, Lord. I pray for those in this room that don't know you as Lord and Savior and pray that their hearts will be good soil this morning, that they might come to know you and the power of your resurrection. I pray for each person who knows you and is filled with you, indwelt by you. I pray, Lord, that you would help us wherever we are on life's road, wherever we are in spiritual growth, that you will help us to take the next step, to cultivate you in our lives, to grow in your spirit, that we can take your love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and self-control out of these doors and into the world where we can be your light we can be yourself. We can be the Bible that some people, the only one they will ever read. Pray it in your name. As we pray the prayer you taught us to pray, and we're gonna pray this together, and if you don't know, the words will be on the screen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on this earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our sin as we give those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. A life fully lived within the circle of love requires being grounded in the Word and attentive to the Spirit. This pilgrimage with our God has been called a long obedience in the same direction. That life requires intentionality, thoughtfulness, and patience. But that's not the world we live in. Everywhere we turn, everywhere we listen, we see and hear reactions to everything. They're loud and fast. An onslaught of ideas and opinions assault us every day. Each voice and its reaction is vying for our attention, vying for our allegiance. How do we know what to do, what to think, and how to live? Who do we trust and why? What if we chose to pause and ask the question, who do I hope to become? Perhaps a better question, who is God inviting me to become? If a year from now we ask those we share life with, how have we changed? What would they say? Did we grow more like a follower of Jesus or as a follower of the world? Will we say yes to Jesus' invitation of a long obedience? Obedience has a starting point, confessing Jesus is King. That decision interrupts everything. Nothing can be the same. If he truly is king, it changes the way we live every day. We all become distributed action, bringing his rule and his reign into each moment of our lives. If our answer is yes, then over time we'll begin to understand that we are image bearers, meant to represent Jesus and his kingdom in our daily lives. To do this, we will deepen our relationship with him every day. If we say yes, we will become scarred restorers, people who willingly do battle alongside him for the healing of not only ourselves, but also those we love. If we say yes, we will become known friends, living bravely and vulnerably with everyone we share life with. If we say yes, we'll become daily ambassadors, proactively being sent out each day to share the love of Jesus with others through our acts of generosity, kindness, and words of truth. If we say yes, 
we will become Kingdom Partners people who see life from the vantage point of eternity and will invest in our good God's greater purposes. If we say yes, what might happen for his kingdom? Will you say yes? We are continuing in our series, second week now, of becoming. What are we becoming? What are we growing into? And we're going to be talking in the next few weeks about five what I, what I call different kind of archetypes of what we scripturally are becoming. And today's, today's uh, archetype is being an image bearer. Uh, we're growing. Right? Healthy things grow. That's what we talked about last week. I uh, wanted to bring uh, for you a jalapeno pepper that I grew. I wanted to prove to you, you know, I told you last week, I'm not great at growing things. Just don't look at my cilantro. But I, I grew a jalapeno pepper because as my grandson says, Papa likes it hot. <laughs> We're about growing. Growing. You know, I, I, when I grew up, Iowa's motto was a place to grow. And I don't know why they ever changed it. Because that is the best motto ever. And isn't it true? I've just thought about that my whole life. They changed it to fields of opportunities and different things. You know, that's what branding people do. They always got to come up with a new brand every 10 years. But sometimes it's best to just stick with what's tried and true. We are a place to grow grow children and grow families and grow businesses and as well as corn and beans and livestock, a place to grow. And I, I think we should kind of adopt that right here in this room, in this church, in this body. We are a place to grow. Now, we had friends in town this week that stayed with Wendy and me for a couple of days, and it was fascinating because they are unabashedly, uh, unapologetically not believers. And yeah, we have these great conversations. And one of the conversations that was prompted by our friends was about the Ten Commandments. And talking about which of the Ten Commandments do you really need? And then it would reference George Carlin did a whole shtick on it at one point, saying, you know, reduce it down. And the point was that really it can all be summed up with don't steal. And so we talked about that, I thought that was interesting. So I was thinking about the Ten Commandments this week uh, out of that conversation, and I realized that, yes, I get, the, I get the, the whole idea, but there's a reason for all of them. And one of the, the, one of the commandments we don't get today is, you know, not to have any image, any, don't make any graven image which we don't think much today, but the reality was when it was given in Exodus, it was a huge deal. Because in those days, usually people were ruled by a pharaoh, in, in the case of Exodus, or a king, and the kings often claimed to be gods. And they would rule and then they would make images of themselves as well as themselves as part of an animal or something and say, these are the gods. In fact, in, in Egypt, there were over 1,500 different deities and gods. So when God appears to Moses and he gives the Ten Commandments, it was kind of a revolutionary idea that you, we, we are children of the one creator, God, who is invisible, and you don't make an image of him because, why? He's already made an image of himself. So grab your Bibles and go to the first page of the Bible. <laughs> Genesis chapter 1. And in verse 26, God says, Let us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, let us make mankind, humanity, in our image, in our 
likeness, so that they may, what? Rule. So that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move on the ground. So we humans were created in God's image. And we were created to rule, to have dominion, to have authority. Not just the king, not just the pharaoh, not just the elite people of the world meeting in Geneva or wherever. It, all humans have this divine image imprinted in us, and God's original plan was for us to rule. Now, how were we supposed to rule? Well, let's start with Adam and Eve. You're to be gardeners. You're to be gardeners. Take care of the garden. Cultivate, plant, prune, water, harvest, plant again. Healthy things grow. Growing things change. <laughs> we were meant to grow things. And that's how we rule. Not by level three top-down power, but from level one serving, planting, cultivating, loving. That's how we rule. What's the chain reaction of praise? We give thanks in all circumstances, which activates our faith to pray powerful prayers so that we can overcome evil as we learn to rule and reign with Christ. Well, it starts from the very beginning. We were made as image bearers. But, <laughs> we, as we know the story, Adam and Eve were given a choice. You can rule and have dominion by God's definition of ruling, which is to be a gardener, or, and because God, and also notice that in Genesis chapter one, God said, it's good. You're good. Humanity is good. I made this great creation. But Adam and Eve said, you know what? I, no, we're gonna decide what's good and what is evil. And from that point on, we have a problem. Because while God, we're made in God's image and humanity does some amazing things, don't we? We can send people to the moon. We can come up with all sorts of medicines to heal sicknesses. We can, we can watch the Olympics. We can do amazing things with these bodies. But we also have anger and pride and violence and wars. We have all sorts of ways that we muck things up. So let's face it, humans <laughs> have, are pretty mediocre rulers of God's creation. Which is why God, God sent Jesus. So I want you to go back to Colossians chapter one, if you're following along in your Bibles. And let's go back to the, the verses we read two weeks ago when we talked about God's presence. Beginning at verse 15. The Son, Jesus, capital S, is the image of the invisible God, 
the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is the alpha point, the omega point. He is the big bang and he is the new Jerusalem. He, from him flows all things and to him flows all things. Jesus is it. The image, the firstborn. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the dark matter, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. So Jesus comes, and Philippians chapter 2 tells us he came to show us the way. He came to show us how he wants humanity to rule. And that's by serving. By washing the feet of the people that are beneath you. To take care of the people that don't have what you have to take love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and self-control and to plant it, cultivate it with everyone, every day. So, I was thinking about this this week. You know, I have, I, I have said many times in this room, we are all ministers of the gospel of Christ. If you are a believer, you are a minister of the gospel of Christ. You are part of a royal priesthood. You are a priest who intercedes with people that don't know him. And by Love and joy and peace and patience and kindness, goodness, self-control. We help others grow to know him and grow in him. Everyone, every day, helping one another experience the life-giving freedom in Christ. So now flip over to Colossians chapter 3. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above. Level four thinking. Whatever is true and good and worthy and honoring. Where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above. Level four. Not on earthly things on level three. For you died to yourself, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ as your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, the acts of the flesh, sexual immorality and impurity and lust and evil desires and greed, the same things that Paul lists as the acts of the flesh in Galatians chapter 5. Because, these, because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. But guess what? You've been growing. You came to know Christ. And now the things of God, the fruit of the Spirit, the word that, the seed of the word that has been planted, the Holy Spirit that is indwelling you, is causing you to grow. But now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger and rage, malice, slander, filthy language. Don't lie to each other, since you've taken off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, the image. We are putting on the image of Christ through our love and our joy 
and our patience. What does he say? And have put on the new self, which is being renewed. It's growing, because what happens when things grow? They replenish, they come again, annuals, they grow and they harvest, and then we die some more, and then we come back to life, and we grow some more, and we harvest some more. That's how God created things to work. You put on the new self, which is renewed in knowledge in the image of the creator. We are growing in the image of Christ. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with the fruits of the Spirit. Compassion, kindness, and humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with one another and forgive one another. Why? Because where you're growing and where I'm at in my growth process may be two different places. So I am not to demand that you be exactly where I am. And you are not to demand of me that I be exactly where you are because God is telling a story in each of us. And our job is to forgive one another and patiently be kind and love one another exactly where you are because guess what? That's what God does. So we are supposed to help one another grow, and as we do, we're recreating the garden because that's how God wants us to rule, by serving and making things grow. You know, uh, Pella um, is an amazing little town. I tell people all the time, I'm, I network with people on Teams and Zoom all, from all over the United States, and people are always asking me, where are you from? I'm in Iowa, place to grow. And they go, where? I said, Pella, Iowa. And I always say to people, it's the coolest little town in America. Look it up. You know, our town was founded by a man of God and his wife. And he determined that he wanted to create a city of refuge on the Iowa prairie. And he wanted Pella to be a place that people grow in the image of Christ. So back in the 1800s, there was a famous book, hardly even remembered today, but the book's called Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan. And in Pilgrim's Progress, it follows the pilgrim, this, this man named Pilgrim, through his spiritual cultivation and growth and struggles all the way to spiritual maturity. So, Pastor Sculte, Domini Sculte, decided that Pella streets from east, why east? Because that's where Christ is coming back, from the east. So from east to west, the streets were named for the stages of Pilgrim's Progress, beginning with entrance because all of us have to enter into that relationship with Christ. And then the next street was inquiring, because we have to ask and seek and knock consistently. And then the next street was perseverance, because in life we're, we face challenge, and challenge forces me to trust God, the chain reaction of praise, and what are we learning when we're challenged? Perseverance. And the next street was reformation. Why? Because we have to reform ourselves. We have to put to death the things of the flesh in order to be alive in the spirit. And the next street was gratitude. Because why? Because we learn as we grow in Christ how much we have to be thankful for. 
If you read my blog this week, you know, Wendy and I, our basement flooded for the second time in, in a matter of weeks this week. And it was bad. I mean, it was, it was bad. And all week long, Wendy and I, as we sit down to pray in the morning, it's just like, we have so much to be thankful for, including Brad Hesseltine, who has a business to help us. And I texted Brad, and I said, yeah, we had some water, and he started asking me a question, well, how much? So I finally, I just, I, I texted him photos of our basement. Ten minutes later, there's a knock at the door. <laughs> Here I am. Here's what you need to do. Thank God I have somebody to give me some direction and some help. So we, we, we persevere and we reform we, and we're thankful. And as we gain experiences, the next street, and then patience, and then confidence, because as we grow in Christ, I know, I know my Redeemer. <laughs> And I know that my Redeemer lives and that I am going to live and reign with him. And then comes expectation because guess what? The further I grow in Christ, the more I know where I am going and I can't wait to get there. And then there was a street called The End and that's where the cemetery is. <laughs> true, true story. Now, I've said this before, we can rename the streets, and we did, but we will never change the motivation and the inspiration with which they were laid. And that was to help things grow. That's our town. That was how it was founded. And now I think about this room. And I think about, again, not only do we believe in the royal priest, the priesthood of all believers, but we believe in the ministry of all vocations. Meaning what you do every week, where you go to work, and sometimes that work is staying home and helping little things grow. But no matter what your vocation is, it is a ministry. I think about the teachers in this room. Think about Doug, think about Jared, both teachers and coaches, and the people who, who serve in our schools. You are helping things grow. I think about the medical professionals in this room. I think about Anne, and I think about Julie, and I think about the, the doctors and the nurses. They are every day in those exam rooms helping to bring healing to people. I think about Gina and Matthew who sit in their offices and they are helping people mentally and, and emotionally and relationally to grow. I think about entrepreneurs like Nooper, and I think about people who are running businesses. Think about Dave, uh, Dave Hopkins and Bristol. See, I love their, I love, you know, when they started Hopkins Roofing, I love the logo, Roofing Done For Good. That's a ministry, because it's not just about the roof. It's about the service. The same thing with Brad. So now let me bring it all back. How can you, this week, help things grow? Knowing that it also begins with me. If I am not cultivating the word and the spirit in my own life, putting off the things of the flesh and filling myself with the things of the spirit, then I'm not going to be healthy. And if I'm not healthy and growing, I can't help somebody else to grow. 
But know this, I love that our God uses everybody. He does. Even, even I will tell you, you know, our friends that were with us this week who are unapologetically, unabashedly not believers, God has used them in my life in a, in a number of ways. Wendy, wouldn't you say that? Yeah. So no matter where you are in the growth cycle, you can still help somebody else grow by being patient and kind and loving and joyful. We can do that every day with everyone. You are the image. You were created to rule. Rule not with power and tyranny, but with the service and growth. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, help us. Help us. Oh, to know you more. Help us, Lord, to see that every day we have the opportunity to be ministers of the gospel of Christ through our vocations and through our community and through, our, through this body of believers, through... <laughs> Help us to make a difference, Lord. Help us to grow. And help us to help others to grow. In you. In Jesus' name.